In the last chapter, Yahweh crushed the rebellion against Moses and Aaron by opening up the earth to swallow three rebels with their families and sending out fire to consume the rest of the 250. But on the day after that, quote, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed Yahweh's people, end quote. So Yahweh killed 14,700 more of Israel with plague, and the plague would have kept going if Aaron hadn't stopped it. So Aaron's authority is not obvious to Israel. Maybe they'll learn from a peaceful lesson. Number 17, verse 1. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and take rods from them, one for each father's house of all their princes according to their father's houses, twelve rods. Write each man's name on his rod. You shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, for there shall be one rod for each of the father's houses. Comment. Remember, there are really thirteen tribes of Israel. We tend to remember them as twelve and not thirteen because Israel only had twelve sons, and because Levi is often omitted from the list. When Yahweh counted the men for war, for example, he omitted Levi. When they parcel out the land years from now, he's going to omit Levi again. So Levi is often forgotten, but they're important because it's they whom Yahweh has drawn near and taken for himself. In Numbers chapter 1, Yahweh named 12 men as heads of their tribes, but since he left out Levi, Aaron's name wasn't among the princes. But now Yahweh will make plain and certain that Aaron is the head of the tribe of Levi. We knew all along that the head would either be Aaron or his brother Moses, but now Yahweh's making it explicit. Aaron is the head of Levi. And by the way, he's Moses' older brother by three years, Exodus 7.7. 7. So Moses is going to take these 13 rods, each bearing the name of a head of a tribe. And Yahweh says, verse 4, You shall lay them up in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. Comment, the testimony is the ark, the ark of the testimony. Moses will put the rods before it, which is to say he's going to put them before Yahweh. Yahweh goes on, verse 5, It shall happen that the rod of the man whom I shall choose shall bud. I will make the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against you, cease from me. Comment, the murmuring will cease for now, and it won't be as bad in the future when it comes back again. There won't be any more full-scale rebellions against Moses and Aaron. This demonstration is going to show all Israel who the man is that Yahweh chooses. Verse 6, Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and all their princes gave him rods, for each prince one according to their father's houses, a total of twelve rods. Aaron's rod was among their rods. Comment, Aaron's makes thirteen. Verse 7, Moses laid up the rods before Yahweh in the tent of testimony. On the next day, Moses went into the tent of testimony, and behold, Aaron's rod for the house of Levi had sprouted, budded, produced blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. Moses brought out all the rods from before Yahweh to all the children of Israel. They looked, and each man took his rod. Comment. No doubt Moses called a meeting of the thirteen to give the rods back so that everyone can see that nobody's rod budded except Aaron's. Verse 8, Aaron's rod sprouted, meaning it had leaves and maybe branches, and it budded. A bud is the beginning of a flower. It produced blossoms, meaning some of the buds were opened into flowers. And what does a flower eventually produce if Yahweh blesses it? It produces the fruit, which in this case was ripe almonds. Verse 10, Yahweh said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept for a token against the children of the rebellion, that you may make an end of their murmurings against me, that they not die. Moses did so as Yahweh commanded him, so he did. Comment. Hebrews 9.4 tells us that Aaron's rod wound up inside the ark along with the golden pot filled with manna and the two tablets on which Yahweh wrote the Ten Commandments. We know the dimensions of the ark from Exodus 25.10, which are 3 feet 9 by 2 feet 3 by 2 feet 3. If these were the interior dimensions, it could contain a rod 4 feet 8 inches, which would come to the shoulder of a man about 5 feet 6 inches tall. So the rod would fit. How did the people respond? Verse 12. The children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who keeps approaching Yahweh's tabernacle dies. Will we all perish? 
Comment, that's a good question. Certainly they will all perish in the wilderness, but what will be their eternal fate? Numbers 14.20, after the incident of the twelve spies and their refusal to enter the land, Yahweh wanted to destroy them, destroy them all, but Moses prayed for them, and then Yahweh said, quote, I have pardoned them according to your word, end quote. But Yahweh went on to say, they're going to die in the wilderness. In other words, that incident didn't seal their spiritual fate, but they'd still have to live with the natural consequences of their refusal to enter the land. Yahweh wasn't going to give them a second chance on reaping the rewards of the land in this life. But hopefully, some of them at least will enter the land eventually, along with you and me on the day that Yahweh establishes his eternal kingdom in Zion. But about that rod, it's a symbol of guidance, discipline, authority, rulership, royalty, power, and judgment. The priesthood rested firmly with Aaron, which is a picture of the priesthood resting firmly with Christ, and that's what this story is ultimately about. Let's mention some scriptures about Christ's rod and what he'll use it for. Psalm 2, 9, quote, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, end quote. This refers to Christ's second coming and bringing the world into his subjection. Isaiah 11, 4, quote, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked, end quote. This means when he comes, he'll simply say the word and his enemies will be destroyed. But the rod's not always for destruction. It's also for comfort, guidance, and discipline. Psalm 23, 4, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, end quote, meaning God uses his rod like a shepherd to guide us and keep us out of trouble. So the rod is the great shepherd's all-purpose tool for guiding his flock and ultimately for taking retribution and establishing peace. Hebrews 2.8, all things will be subject to Christ, but not all things are subjected to him yet. Quote, but now we don't see all things subjected to him yet. End quote. So that's an explanation for the chaos we see today in the world. Not all things are subjected to him yet, but it's coming. When he comes, he'll bring the rod. The rod is violent, but it's the only thing that can establish the ultimate peace. You see, he's not coming next time quietly as a lamb to be slaughtered. He's coming as a lion, Revelation 5, 5, as a king to rule in power and authority, Revelation 19, 16. His coming will be in the open, Matthew 24, 27, and Matthew 24, 30. Everyone will see him, and no one will have any doubt who he is. His identity will be immediately apparent to anyone at his coming, to everyone at his coming. The tribes of the earth will mourn, Matthew 24, 30, because he brings his rod with him, Revelation 19, 15. That's the chapter. The easiest place to follow the links is landofhavilah.net. Next time for Numbers 18. Numbers 18.